very good morning today we are starting with the chapter of deductions from gross total income deductions from gross total income what is the difference between other deductions and this deduction deductions section 80c2 section 80u other deductions you had head wise deductions income from salary you had section 16 income from house property <coughs> section 24 pgvp section 32 section 38 capital gain you had the entire mechanism section 48 red with section 55 red with section 49 and i force you had section 57 so we have learned a lot of deductions but this deduction is slightly different as compared to other deductions the deductions which we had learned they are from respective head of income whereas this deductions are from gross total income these are from gross total income this is the first difference second difference is in case of heads of income there is a possibility that your deduction can be more than the income in that case you will be having a loss for example in house property chapter if your interest on loan amount is much higher than the net annual value you will have a loss similar in business also if your expenses are more you will have a loss similar in the head of capital gain also if your cost of acquisition and cost of implement is more as compared to the net consideration you will have a loss that is the final amount of income can be negative but here your deduction cannot exceed the income your deduction cannot exceed the total income if you recollect in the chapter of capital gain itself i had explained you that deductions from gross total income section 80c to 80u which are called as chapter 6a deductions are available only against those income which are taxable at slab rate and they are also restricted to the amount of income which is taxable at slab rate so your final income taxable income can never be negative so your deduction should not exceed the gross total income so first point of distinction is section 80c to 80u is deduction from your gross total income whereas other deductions are from respective head of income second point deduction from gross total income cannot exceed the income if it exceeds the income deductions would be restricted to the amount of income thereby making your income to be zero your total income can never be negative deductions which you get under the respective head of income can be more than the amount of income in that case you will be having losses and the purpose of giving deduction is altogether different purpose of giving deduction to you in salary house property business profession capital gain other sources is to ensure that you get deduction for the expenditure which you are incurring for earning the income whatever expenditure you incur for earning the income that is claimed as deduction 
whereas here section 80c to 80u the objective is social or economic benefit either there is a social benefit or there is a economic benefit or there is a objective of economic development of and growth of the country these are the objectives which are kept in mind while making the chapter of deduction from gross total income so we want to understand deductions from gross total income this flow chart we have already discussed in the chapter of capital gain saying that your income is divided in two parts income taxable at fixed rate income taxable at slab rate i am sure you might still remember that your long term capital gain if it is covered by section 112 is taxable at 20% If it is short term capital gain covered by section triple one A, it is taxable at fifteen percentage. Your long term capital gain covered by section one hundred and twelve A is taxable at ten percentage, and winnings from lottery, cross road percent, etc., is taxable at thirty percentage. These four incomes are taxable at fixed rate. Against this income, chapter six hundred and twenty are not available. All other incomes are taxable at slab rates. Slab rate means in case of individual HUF association of person body of individual artificial juridical persons slab rates other cases normal rates. Here this flowchart is intentionally made for resident individual and HUF resident individual and HUF. Here we here we have written if the chapter six deduction is more than the amount of income which is taxable at slab rate then your chapter six deduction. would be restricted to the amount of income which is taxable at slab rate next if your chapter 6 deduction is if your chapter 6 deduction after if your total income after chapter 6 deduction if, if your total income after chapter 6 deduction is less than the basic exemption limit then you will calculate the unexhausted basic exemption limit an unexhausted basic exemption limit is nothing but basic exemption limit minus the income which is taxable at slab rate after chapter 6a deduction this unexhausted basic exemption limit can be adjusted against long term capital gain short term capital gain section 311a but it cannot be adjusted against winnings that is what we have already discussed in the chapter of capital gain same thing i am i have revised for you now we move on to this section 80c to 80u most of the chapters at the beginning of the chapter itself have given you the list of section numbers in this chapter section number is very important in this chapter is section number is very important you have to remember all the section numbers the only way to remember this is you have to read it twice or thrice it is a six five seven days course every day after having lunch and dinner read it for 5 minutes the way you have your medicines so we have chapter 6 reductions from section atc to section atu this chapter 6 reduction broadly it can be classified into three categories category 1 2 and 3 category 1 is payment based reduction payment based reduction means only if you actually made the payment you can claim the claim the deduction for example salary chapter you had deduction for profession tax which was allowed on payment basis house property chapter you had deduction for municipal tax this was allowed on payment basis similarly here pgbp chapter you had section 43b wherein deductions were allowed on payment basis similarly here section 80c to section 80 ggc section 80c to section 80 ggc these deductions are available on payment basis so you have to actually make the payment then only you can claim the deduction then we have second category of deduction called as income based deduction income based deduction there are lot of sections right from section 80 ia to section 80 ttb section 80 ia to section 80 ttb out of these sections only three four sections are there at ca intermediate level rest all are forming part of your ca final syllabus 
basically income based deduction is nothing but deduction for those things those incomes which is which are forming part of a gross total income for example you calculate the income in all these five heads of income and you get the amount of gross total income once you have calculated the amount of gross total income here we will deduct income based deductions for example for example just to make you understand what is this income based deduction See, long back, India did not have the mobile telephony. We had only landline connections. Mobile telephony entered the in, entered India in very late 1990s, around 98-2000. When it entered, the outgoing charges for the call were around 15 to 16 rupees per minute, and the incoming charges were 8 rupees per minute. As of now, the incoming charges are free. Whereas outgoing charges are also negligible. So, <coughs> who can afford such a high rate of outgoing and incoming charges? No one. So, government came out with an idea. Government amended one section in the Income Tax Act. And they said that if you start telecommunication business in India, then you will enjoy a tax holiday for 15, 15 years. You will enjoy a tax holiday for 15 years means for 15 years we will not charge you any tax see generally big big corporates they have to pay tax at at least 30 percentage plus surcharge plus cess if they are into some other businesses if they start telecommunication business no tax at all for 15 days oh, sorry 15 years no tax at all for 15 years this is the biggest advantage so, government had come out with a section in this chapter 6 reduction. They amended one section saying that we will offer you a tax holiday for 15 years if you start the telecommunication business. The moment this section was introduced, this amendment was introduced, every industrialist was behind the telecommunication business. Tata's entered this business, Reliance enters the, entered this business in a very big way. And lot many other companies also entered into these businesses. Slowly, slowly, there was more competition and the prices were slashed. And today we are just paying 50 paise per minute as outgoing charges and the incoming charges are totally free of cost. This is the result of a small change in the Income Tax Act. So, they just said that whatever income you earn from your telecom business, would be definitely falling into this PGBP head. But same income entirely, we will allow you deduction here. So say for example, some big company might have one day income of 50 crores from telecom business. That same 50 crores will be deducted here. So basically, in the taxable income, this 50 crores will not be part of taxable income and they are not required to pay tax on this. So there are a lot of such sections which are still there in the Income Tax Act, they are called as income based deduction. They are forming part of your CF final syllabus. Have you understood this? Have you got some idea with respect to what is income based deduction? Yes or no? But in this in this C intermediate syllabus, we have only three, four, six, four sections precisely. Uh, section 80 QQB, Section 80 RRB, Section 80 TTA and Section 80 TTB. We have only four sections which are relating to income based reduction here. And then we have last category, residuary category of section that is other deduction and that is Section 80U. So broadly our Section 80C to 80U, they are divided into three categories, payment based reduction, income based reduction and other deduction. So, first of all, we will start with payment based deduction. The biggest section will be starting today and that is section ATC. Section ATC. This deduction is in respect of certain investments and payments. This deduction is in respect of certain investments and payments. See, in every deduction, in every deduction, in every section, we need to understand few things. Number one, deduction is allowed for what? 
for what purpose the direction is allowed for what thing the direction is allowed whether the direction is allowed for investment or it is allowed for expenditure it is allowed for what that is the first point we need to understand second is the section number you need to remember third is is there any maximum limit for deduction or you can claim unlimited deduction see in chapter of house property in case of self forward property there was a maximum limit of 2 lakh for claiming deduction with respect to interest on loan similarly question is do you have some maximum limit for deduction or you can claim deduction for unlimited amount that is the third point and fourth point is are there any conditions which are required to be fulfilled for claiming the deduction so our discussion in each and every section will be divided in these four parts so we want to first section that is section atc this one is section atc deduction in respect of savings and investment deduction in respect of savings and investment see there are different different avenues of saving money if you save money there then government says we will, we will give you deduction or there are different different avenues of making investments so government has listed down some 23 points if you either invest money there or you save money there you can claim deduction under section atc now the point is who all are eligible to claim deduction under section atc whether individual hf firm company every person can claim deduction or not so here for the purpose of section atc deduction we are dividing the ssc into two categories if ssc is individual hf this should this notes will be provided to you this notes will be provided to you if i explain you something which is beyond this notes then if you want you can write if i explain you something which is beyond this notes which is not written here then if you want you can write this notes will be provided to you don't worry so ssc is an individual hf and any other ssc any other ssc cannot claim section atc deduction any other ssc cannot claim section atc deduction only individual hf can claim deduction irrespective of whether they are resident or non resident even a resident even a even resident individual as well as non resident individual can claim the deduction ssc can claim deduction provided he is spending money or investing money in whose name that is the question so ssc if an ssc is huf then they can spend money or they can invest money for the benefit of any member of family if ssc is huf they can either spend money or invest money for any member of family in that case you can claim in that case huf can claim deduction second possibility is ssc is individual in case ssc is individual he can invest money or he can spend money for whose benefit he can spend money for himself or herself he can spend money for spouse irrespective of whether the spouse is dependent or independent you can spend money for your children irrespective of whether the children are dependent or independent married or unmarried minor or major they are of sound mind or unsound mind they are son or daughter it will not make any difference you can invest money you can spend money for the benefit of your children in other words deduction will be allowed to you so you can invest money in your own name in the name of spouse or in the name of your children irrespective of whether they are dependent independent don't look at the variety examiners will intentionally write the word independent child still you can claim deduction in section atc for independent child also you can claim deduction in section atc in further part of the chapter there are sections wherein you can claim deduction only for a dependent child not for the independent child but here you can claim deduction for a dependent child as well as an independent child these things are very very important 
if you invest money in the name of parents brother sister then you can't claim deduction in other words your father can invest money in your name and he can claim deduction but if you invest in the name of your father then you can't claim deduction so deduction is allowed only if you are spending money or investing money for yourself for your spouse or for your children so three alphabets you can remember sse you can remember sse self spouse and children self spouse and children is there any maximum limit for claiming deduction under section atc yes there is a maximum limit what is that maximum limit 1 lakh 50000 rupees 1 lakh 50000 rupees so you compare the actual expenditure or actual investment with the maximum limit of 1 lakh 50000 and whichever is lower you can claim deduction say for example your expenditure or your investment your expenditure or your investment is 2 lakhs your expenditure or investment is 2 lakhs then we will give you deduction only for 1 lakh 50 if your expenditure or investment is 1 lakh 20 then we will give you deduction for 1 lakh 20 in other words deduction will be allowed for actual amount invested or spent compared to a maximum limit of 1 lakh 50 thousand So, till now in section 80C, we have understood three points, three things. Number one, deduction is allowed for what? That we will discuss in detail, there are 23 points. But yes, broadly we can say that yes, deduction is allowed either for expenditure, specified expenditure or making investment in a specified avenue. Number two, eligible SSE, who can claim deduction only? Individual and HUF can claim deduction, other SSEs cannot. Individual and HUF can claim deduction irrespective of whether they are resident or non-resident. HUF can claim deduction if the investment is made in the name of any member of family. Whereas individual can claim deduction if the investment is made in the name of self, spouse and children. If the investment is made in the name of parents, brothers or sisters, deduction is not allowed. Deduction cannot be claimed. So now friends, let's move on to the actual notes. We are on page number 280. Eligible SSE, individual NHS may be resident or non-resident. Eligible investment contribution, we have a very big list of 23 points. We have a big list of 23 points. The first and the most important point is life insurance premium. If you have taken a life insurance policy for yourself or for your spouse or for your children, then you can claim deduction in section ATC. You can claim deduction in section ATC. So life insurance premium paid by a person. See what do you mean by person? When we use the word person here in deduction chapter, in section 80C, don't take it as all persons because the scope of this section itself is restricted to individual and HUF. Scope of the section itself is restricted to individual and HUF. So whenever you we use the per, word person, we mean to say individual and HUF. In other words, point number one, individual as well as HUF both can claim the deduction. Individual can claim deduction, even the HUF can claim deduction. See, there are certain points where only individual can claim deduction. So, for each and every point, we have to identify whether individual HUF both can claim deduction or only individual can claim deduction. That is what we need to identify. So, life insurance premium, I am telling you, individual HUF both can claim deduction. Individual HUF both can claim deduction. So, life insurance premium paid to effect or keep in force a life insurance policy. This premium can be claimed as deduction. So, LIC policy can be taken in the name of self, spouse or children in case of individual and any member of family in case of HUF. 
there is one more condition which says that if you have taken a life insurance policy and you are paying premium, we will give you deduction. That is certain. But you should not terminate the policy within two years. If you terminate the policy within two years, whatever deduction we had given you till now, that amount will be taken and that will be added to your income and tax will be levied. For example, you claim deduction of 30,000 in year number one. You claim deduction of 30,000 in year number two. So you have, and, you then, and then you terminate the policy. If you terminate the policy before paying the premium of two years, then whatever deduction was allowed to you in the past, that entire amount of deduction will be added to your income and tax will be levied. That is what is written in point number B. If the policy is terminated or surrendered within two years, then deduction allowed shall be withdrawn and shall be added to the income of the year of termination. Of the year of termination. Say for example, for example, see you know in every policy there is a surrender value. Yes? Yes or no? Have you heard surrender value? In partnership accounts also you might have heard about joint life policy. There also you have surrender value. So say for example, year 1 you paid the premium of 30,000. 30,000 is premium is paid, year number 1. And the surrender value at the end of year number 1 is 0. Surrender value is 0 at the end of year number 1. Year number 2 you paid 30,000 premium. You paid 30,000 premium in year number 2 also and year number 2 you had a surrender value of say 20,000 rupees. See at the initial stage of any policy surrender value will be very low. Now say for example you are cancelling this policy, you are cancelling this policy then how much amount you are going to receive? You are going to receive only 20,000. <clears throat> if you cancel this policy at the end of year number 2, insurance company would pay you only 20,000 rupees. But how much will be taxable to you is 60,000 rupees. 60,000 will be made a taxable to you. So how much you receive is not relevant for us. What deduction we had given you, that is relevant. We had given you a deduction of 30,000 for 2 years, so that total deduction turns out to 60,000, this will be added to income. This will be added to income. You will actually receive only 20,000 from the insurance company on surrender of policy. But what will become taxable to is 60,000 because we had given you deduction for 60,000. Is that very very clear? Yes or no? Are you getting my voice very clearly? Okay. Now, we move on to the very important aspect of this life insurance policy premium deduction. See, when you should ideally take the life insurance policy? Should you go and take the life insurance policy at the age of 58 years? Means it is your time to now leave this world and before that you will take the life insurance policy and you will die and the insurance company will have to pay huge amount of compensation for your family. So generally you should take the life insurance policy this one, yes, 60,000 will become taxable in year number 2. Year number 2, 60,000 will become taxable. Is that very clear? Okay. Now, 
say for example for example see generally you should take life insurance policy at a very young age and you should take the life insurance policy for a very long span of time if you take the life insurance policy at a very young age and you take the life insurance policy for a longer span of time say 20 years 25 years then the premium would be very low premium would be around 5 percentage of sum assured 6 percentage of sum assured do you understand sum assured sum assured means the amount which insurance company will pay to you if the policy expires or the amount which insurance company will pay to your family if you expire the life insurance policy you will get money either when you expire family will receive money or you will receive money if policy expires so you receive money on the expiry either the expiry of person or the policy whichever is earlier someone has to expire so this life insurance policy government says you take the policy at a very young age and you take the policy for a long, very long span of time your premium will be less and we will give you deduction but say for example you are taking life insurance policy at a young age only say 25 years but you took policy only for five years a very short policy of five years in that case premium will be more and in that case government says we will put some restriction for giving you deduction or maybe you take the life insurance policy at very later stage of your life say after 55 years you have taken a life insurance policy in that case premium will be very high and government says we are not going to give you deduction for such a high amount so government has inserted a specific maximum limit for claiming deduction with respect to life insurance premium government has inserted a specific maximum limit for claiming deduction with respect to life insurance premium see section 80c the overall limit is 150000 section 80c the overall limit is rupees 150000 but for life insurance premium there is a separate limit for deduction so for life insurance premium definitely the overall limit of 150000 which is applicable to the entire section by default it is applicable to every every point but for a life insurance policy premium a specific limit is applicable which is certain percentage of sum assured that limit is decided as certain percentage of sum assured so life insurance policy premium deduction would be lower of following two amount life insurance policy premium deduction would be lower of following two amount number one actual premium paid actual premium paid and number two maximum limit this maximum limit is certain percentage of summation this will be the deduction for life insurance premium so for life insurance premium your deduction will be actual premium paid or maximum limit and this maximum limit is certain percentage of sum assured what is the percentage of sum assured how much percentage of sum assured that depends upon date of issue of policy that depends upon two things number one date of issue of policy and number two whether the person in whose name you have taken the policy is a normal person or differently abled person whether that person is a normal person or differently abled person so maximum limit for deduction with respect to life insurance premium depends upon two factors factor number one is date of issue of policy and factor number two is whether the person in whose name you have taken the life insurance policy 
is a normal person or a disabled person or different abled person. So here I have given a table here. If the policy is issued before 1st April 2012, if the policy is issued before 1st April 2012, then the limit is 20 percentage of summation. What is the limit? 20 percentage of summation. If the policy is issued during the financial year 1213, if the policy is issued during the financial year 1213, then the limit is 10 percentage of summation. Limit is 10 percentage of summation. See, government felt that the limit of 20 percent of summation is very high. For example, something, some limits are unrealistic. Unrealistic means in most of the cases it will never apply. For example, for example, Dikshit is a very foodie person. He likes to eat a lot. If he eats more than what is required, he will gain huge weight. And he will have a lot of difficulties. So, Dikshit, Dikshit's mother has put a restriction on his food. How much food you can have? In a day, you can have maximum 30 dosas. Not more than that. So, question is, will he have 30 dosas in a day? This limit is unrealistic. Anyway, he doesn't have 30 dosas a day. So, this limit is unrealistic. In most of the cases, it will not apply. Even if he doesn't have food for 10-15 days. Now, thereafter also, if you serve him dosas, he will not have 30 dosas. So, that limit is unrealistic. Similarly, the limit of 20% of summation was very unrealistic because in most of the cases, this limit was not applicable at all because the actual premium was always less than the limit. Actual premium was always less than the limit. Therefore, government came out with an amendment in the year 2013 and that amendment was a prospective amendment wherein government reduced the limit from 20% of summation to 10% of summation. Government reduced the limit from 20% of summation to 10% of summation. Thereafter, few insurance company requested the government saying that in case of a differently abled person, we have more risk. So, we charge more premium in that in their case. In case of differently abled person, we are covering more risk. So, we charge more premium to them. So, this limit of 10% is not sufficient enough. In most of the cases, this limit of 10% will be easily exceeded. Kindly increase this limit. That is what few insurance companies requested the government and government taking their inputs. Once again, they came out with an amendment in the year 2013. This amendment was 2012 amendment. This was budget 2012 amendment. And this was budget 2013 amendment. In budget 2013 amendment, what they did is, they increased the limit for disabled person to 15% of summation. And for others, they kept it at 10% of summation. So now we have different, different limits for different, different years. It all depends upon the date of issue of policy. If the policy is, policy is issued prior to 1st April 2012, then you take 20% of summation. If the policy is issued during the financial year 1213, then you take 10% of summation. If the policy is issued on or after 1st April 13, in case of normal persons, 10% of summation. In case of different abled person, 15% of summation. Have you understood this? Yes or no? Now, I am telling you a very important point. Please mark this point as very important. Examiner has fooled the students in the past. This limits 20%, 10%, 15%. These are purely applicable to life insurance policies. 
if you are paying premium for life insurance policy, then only these are applicable. So, I have here clearly written, except in case of contract for deferred annuity. Deferred annuity is something else. Life insurance policy is something else. Life insurance policy is taken for financial security of your dependents. Deferred annuity policy will understand when we, when we move on to the further points. So, this limit is not applicable in case of deferred annuity policy. Examiner will create a point saying that SSE has taken a deferred annuity policy from Life Insurance Corporation of India. The moment you are Life Insurance, you will apply these limits, but limits are not applicable. You have to see the nature of policy. If it is a Life Insurance policy, you apply the limits. If it is a deferred annuity policy, do not apply the limits. Even if the deferred annuity policy is taken from Life Insurance Corporation of India. So, do not get into the trap created by the examiner. So, please apply your mind. Do not apply, don't apply this limit to deferred annuity policy. This you can mark it as very important. If you want, you can write this one, one sentence you can write. Limits are applicable. Rizwan, I am coming to that point. I explained, but I am once again coming to that point. Don't worry. You can write one point there. These limits are applicable only in case of life insurance policies, not in case of deferred annuity policies. Here I have written, but if at all you are having some difficulty as to the language is slightly different, then you can write in your own language in a simplified manner. Life insurance policy limits are applicable. Deferred annuity policy limits are not applicable. Rizwan, sum assured means if the policy gets expired, how much amount you are going to receive? Or if the insured person expires, how much amount family will receive? That is called as sum assured. See, you might have heard a lot of people saying, I have bought a policy of 50 lakhs. I have bought a policy of 1 crore. That doesn't mean that he has paid 1 crore and he has got the policy. When he says that I have bought a policy of 1 crore, meaning thereby if something happens to him, then his family will get 1 crore rupees. That 1 crore is called as sum assured. That 1 crore is called as sum assured. This is the assured amount. This is the amount assured by the insurance company to the insured person. If that something happens to you, we will pay this much amount to your family. Rizwan, have you understood? Yes or no? Okay. Now, listen to me very carefully. This note is very important. It is further clarified that any premium agreed to be returned any premium agreed to be returned or any benefit by way of bonus or otherwise over and above sum actually assured shall not be considered as capital sum assured. See, if you take the life insurance policy specifically of LIC of India, then over and above sum assured, they may give you some bonuses. If you stay in that policy for a longer span, say for example, the term of policy is 20 years. You stayed in that policy for 10 years, some bonus will be added to your sum assured. If you stay in that policy for 5 more years, 15 years, to your sum assured, some more bonus will be added. That bonus is not a assured amount. Bonus is not a assured amount. You may get, you may not get. So, that bonus amount should not be taken as part of sum assured. For example, if your sum assured is 1 crore and the term of the policy is say, 20 years. So, it is certain that at the end of 20th year, you will receive 1 crore or during this 20 years, if you die, your family will receive 1 crore. Bonus is not certain. You may receive, you may not receive. So, bonus should not be taken as part of sum assured. Bonus should not be taken as part of sum assured. All these percentages, you need to apply on what? These percentages you need to apply on? Some assured amount. Therefore, 
it is very important that you understand what is the meaning of sum assured. So sum assured should not include any bonus. Sum assured should not include any premium which the insurance company has agreed to return that to you. For example, some insurance companies may come out with a marketing scheme saying that if you stay in the policy for 10 years, your policy tenure is 10 years. If you stay in the policy for 10 years, the last two months premium which you pay, na, we will return back to you. So that amount should not be deducted from the sum assured amount. In other words, that amount should be totally ignored. Is that very, very clear? Yes or no? Yes? Okay. Uh, I have taken one example here to make you understand the consequence of this provisions or how to apply the limits. Example number one for understanding the direction for life insurance premium. Say for example, the term of policy is 5 years. Term of policy is 5 years. Sum assured is 1 lakh. And the actual premium is as follows. Year number 1, year number 2, 3, 4 and 5. So you have taken a life insurance policy for a span of 5 years. And your premium is 25,000, 20,000, 15,000, 10,000 and 5,000. For year number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 respectively. How much is the deduction you can claim in section ATC? How much deduction you can claim under section ATC for different different years? For different different years, you can claim how much deduction? You know that deduction is actual premium paid. Your deduction is actual premium paid or certain percentage of summation. Actual premium paid or certain percentage of summation. Now the point is which percentage you will apply? You have so many percentage, different, different data we show policy, you have different, different percentage. If the examiner doesn't give you the data we show policy, then what? Which percentage you should apply? Should you apply 20? Should you apply 10? Or should you apply the last one 15 and 10? If the examiner doesn't give you the data we show policy, then we should take an assumption that the policy is issued on or after 1st April 2013. In case of normal person, you apply 10%. In case of differently abled person, you apply 15%. So, and you write a note. In the solution, you write a note. In the absence of specific information with respect to the data we show of policy in the question, it is assumed, it is presumed that the policy is issued on or after 1st April 2013. This is the assumption which you should take. Is that very, very clear? Yes or no? Shall I proceed? Okay. Now in this question, in this question, in this example, can you tell me how much percentage we should, we should apply? 10 percentage. 10 percentage. So what is the sum assured? 1 lakh. 10 percent of 1 lakh will be how much? 10,000. 10,000. So, what will be my deduction year wise? Year number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. My actual premium is 25,000. For year 1, 20. For year 2, 15,000. For year 3, 10,000. For year 4, and 5,000. For year 5. Every year I need to apply the limit of 10% sum assured, that is 10,000. My deduction for year number 1 will be whichever is lower out of 25 and 10. That is 10,000. For year 2, once again 20 or 10, which is lower 10,000. For year 3, 15 or 10, which is lower 10. For year 4, both are equal. So 10. Year 5, deduction is 5,000. Have you understood this? Yes or no? Okay. Now let's move on to the last but the most important part of this life insurance policy premium dis discussion. If you recollect, if you recollect in the chapter of income from other sources, na, we had discussed key man insurance policy versus life insurance policy. While explaining you that life insurance policy, I told you that generally 
the life insurance policy maturity proceeds are exempt from tax generally life insurance policy maturity proceeds are exempt from tax but life insurance policy maturity proceeds can also become taxable in certain circumstances it can also become taxable in certain circumstances listen to me carefully if if during the tenure of policy in our example what is the tenure of policy in our example tenure of policy is 5 years if during the tenure of policy in any year during the tenure of policy in any year if the actual premium is more than the limit what is that limit 10% of sum assured in this case if during the tenure of policy in any year if the actual premium is more than the limit do you believe that in our example your actual premium is more than the limit yes in year number 1 2 as well as 3 in year number 1 2 and 3 your actual premium is more than the limit prescribed you should not look at this actually you should look at this actual premium this column your actual premium for this 3 years is more than the limit prescribed which is 10000 so during the tenure of policy if during any year if your actual premium is more than the limit prescribed then you have to face two consequences you have to face two consequences consequence number 1 your deduction will be restricted to the limit prescribed your deduction will be restricted to the limit prescribed whatever is the limit to that extent your deduction will be restricted so in this case also we restricted the deduction in year number 1 2 and 3 at 10000 rupees we restricted the deduction in year number 1 2 and 3 at 10000 rupees this is the first consequence this is the first consequence and second consequence is maturity proceeds of that life insurance policy will become fully taxable maturity proceeds of that life insurance policy will become fully taxable generally maturity proceeds of life insurance policy are exempt but if during any year if during any year in the tenure of the policy if the premium exceeds the prescribed limit in that case maturity proceeds will be fully taxable consequences if the actual premium exceeds the limit prescribed what is the consequence if the actual premium exceeds the limit prescribed consequence number 1 deduction under section 80c will be restricted to the prescribed limit and that limit can be 20% 15% 10% whichever is applicable to you consequence number 2 maturity proceeds will not be exempt will not be exempt in section 10 clause 10d it will be totally taxable maturity proceeds will be totally taxable is that very very clear have you understood this point point number 1 life insurance premium deduction yes or no yes let me ask you a very simple question say for example you have, uh, you have taken life insurance policy for your dependent sister you have taken a life insurance policy for your dependent sister and you are paying premium can you claim deduction yes can you claim deduction if you have taken life insurance policy for your dependent sister and you are paying premium can you claim deduction yes or no are you getting my voice no answer is no you can't because deduction is allowed only for self spouse children hf can claim deduction for any member of family dikshit says sir explain consequence to us dikshit generally the maturity proceeds 
maturity proceeds means sum assured. For example, here in our example, what is the amount of sum assured? 1 lakh, correct? It is 1 lakh. Do you believe that your actual premium has exceeded the limit during any year in the term of the policy? Yes. Where it has exceeded the limit? It has exceeded the prescribed limit in year number 1, year number 2 and year number 3. So you have to face two consequences. Consequence number 1, your deduction under section 80C will be restricted to the limit. What is the limit? 10,000. So your deduction under section 80C will be restricted to 10,000. This is the first consequence. Second consequence, at the end of year 5, at the end of year 5, you will receive 1 lakh rupees. At the end of year 5, you will receive 1 lakh rupees. This 1 lakh rupees will become fully taxable to you. This 1 lakh rupees will become fully taxable to you. Have you understood this? Yes or no? Dixit? Yes, okay. So, with this, we have completed the first point of section ADC that is life insurance premium. Now, I will take you through three points simultaneously. We have already discussed these three points in the chapter of income from salaries. These three points we have already discussed in the chapter of income from salaries. Point number two. Sarvana is asking if any year exceed in full taxable on submission. Yes, Sarvana, even if the premium exceeds once in the entire tenure of the policy, if the tenure of policy is say for example 20 years, even if the premium exceeds in one of those 20 years, then also your entire maturity proceeds will be taxable. Let me tell you very clearly saying that generally if you take the policy for a longer span of time, your premium will never exceed the prescribed limit. People are investing in life insurance policy because they want the exempt amount at the end of the tenure of the policy. So insurance policy, insurance companies, they themselves are aware about this. So when you take a policy for a longer span, say 15-20 years, in that case, your actual premium will never exceed the prescribed limit. Your actual premium will be in the range of 5 to 6 percentage of sum assured. So, it will never exceed 10 percent. But if you are taking policy for a very short duration or you are taking policy at a very later stage of your life, maybe when you are in your late 50s, then your premium may exceed the limit prescribed. Is that very, very clear? Yes or no? So, we have completed point number 1. We have completed point number 1. Point number 2, point number 3 and point number 4. We have already completed in the chapter of income from salaries. If you recollect in the chapter of income from salaries, we had a separate discussion on taxability of provident fund from the point of view of employee. We had different, different types of fund. Statutory provident fund, recognized provident fund, unrecognized provident fund, yes or no, public provident fund, approved superannuation fund. For all these funds, we had discussed tax treatment of four components. Number one, employees contribution. Number two, employers contribution. Number three, interest credited to the fund. And number four, amount withdrawn from that fund at the time of retirement. What will be the tax treatment? What will be the tax treatment? So, we had discussed that for employees contribution, you can claim deduction in section 80C. You can claim deduction in section 80C. Say for, if you want to refer, I will tell you the page number. It is page number 45 in your book. Page number 4545.
पेज नंबर फोर्टी फाइव लेट मी टेक यू टू दैट पेज सी आर यू हैव डिफरेंट डिफरेंट टाइप्स ऑफ प्रोविडेंट फंड यू ऑल्सो हैव अप्रूव सुपर एंशन फंड वी आर डिस्कस वॉट इज द ट्रीटमेंट ऑफ एम्प्लॉज कंट्रीब्यूशन वेर द डिडक्शन इज अलाउड इन सेक्शन एटी सी आर नॉट फॉर स्टैचुटरी प्रोविडेंट फंड रेकग्नाइज प्रोविडेंट फंड पब्लिक प्रोविडेंट फंड एंड सुपर एन्यूशन फंड डिडक्शन इज अलाउड but deduction is not allowed if you contribute money to unrecognized provident fund so definitely you should have a reference to this point na in section 80c yes or no so here we are having point number 2 contribution to statutory provident fund contribution to recognized provident fund Point number three, contribution to public provident fund. If you invest money in public provident fund, your funds will be blocked for a period of fifteen years. You also have contribution to approved superannuation fund. Yes, is that very clear? Now, point number one, life insurance premium. Who can claim deduction? Individual as well as HUF can claim deduction. HUF can claim deduction for premium paid for any member of family. Individual can claim deduction for self spouse and children. Second, contribution to statutory provident fund. Contribution to recognised provident fund. Who can claim deduction? Only individual can claim deduction. Why only individual? Yes. Contribution to statutory provident fund. Contribution to recognised provident fund. they say that only individual can claim deduction why so because this is for those who are doing the job those people who are doing the job for them only there will be provident fund na how can there be a provident fund for hf hf cannot do job hf cannot have income from salary are you understanding public provident fund a person can claim deduction means individual As well as HUF, both can claim deduction. Approved superannuation fund, once again only individual can claim deduction. Yes, is that very clear? So we have covered four points till now. We have covered four points. We have covered four points. i'll give you 2 minutes time i want you to refer to point number 5 7 and 8 point number 5 7 and 8 kindly refer to this quickly have you referred to point number 5 yes or no yes so i'll do point number 5 uh in the chapter of income from salaries we had discussed something called as pension if you are an employee if you are doing job and if you retire then after retirement you will receive monthly amount fixed amount from employer that is called as pension and that monthly pension is also called as uncommuted pension it is totally taxable in case of government employees as well as non government employees what about others those people who are self employed those who are into businesses for them who is going to give them pension after the retirement no one is going to give them pension after retirement so they should worry about themselves what they should do they can buy the pension schemes which are made by banks and you know, made by financial institutions and insurance companies say for example lic of india is also having a pension scheme where you invest money in that scheme throughout your life say for example you have contributed money to the pension scheme from the age of 30 years up to the age of 60 years now after 60 you will retire and thereafter lic of india will give you pension every month so 
in this case life insurance corporation of india is giving you pension so while you are doing job uh, while you are earning income throughout your life you go on contributing money to the pension fund to the pension scheme once you are retired the insurance company will give you pension every month so after your retirement you will receive pension that pension will be taxable to you under income from other sources but right now when you are contributing money to this pension scheme we will give you deduction in section 80c we will give you deduction in section 80c see a pensioned society is a safe society a pensioned society people are not worried about their future because they know that they will get some pension see there are a lot of developed countries in the world for example uk uk if a person retires then government of uk will give him some fixed amount of money every month that is not possible in country like india so you should think about your retirement life you take some pension plans you take some pension plans you invest money in those pension plans you claim deduction in section 80c and once you retire you will claim you will get a monthly pension from the insurance company or mutual fund and that amount will become definitely taxable to you under income from other sources have you understood this contribution to any noti fund pension fund set up by mutual fund or uti yes okay who can claim deduction only individual only individual why because only individual can retire na only individual can retire artificial persons cannot retire only natural person can retire individual is that very clear so we have covered up how many points five points till now we have covered five points in section atc point number 6 point number 6 is uh, amount contributed to national pension scheme what is this national pension scheme that we will discuss in detail when we get into section 80 ccd when we get into this section 80 ccd we will discuss what is national pension scheme but right now we have to understand that any money which you contribute to pension fund of any insurance company or any mutual fund or any money which you contribute to national pension scheme all these contributions can be claimed as deduction under section <coughs> atc <coughs> who can claim deduction only individual can claim deduction in section 80 c with respect to this amount contributed to national pension scheme see now i'll make you understand the difference between two three terms i will explain you what is annuity policy what is annuity policy life insurance policy objective of life insurance policy objective of investment in units of mutual fund first of all let us try to understand what is annuity policy see i have explained you pension fund pension fund means a fund created by financial institutions or insurance company or mutual funds you invest money in that pension fund for a certain uh, up to you up to the age of 60 years till you reach the age of 60 years you go on investing money in that pension fund and once you attain the age of 60 years you are retired thereafter you will receive pension from that pension fund annuity policy is a concept which is similar to pension fund with only one change 
in pension fund you receive money after you retire whereas annuity policy you receive money from from the moment the term of an annuity policy comes to an end for example for example manoj completed his chartered accountancy and he has joined his first job at the age of say 25 years he has joined his first job at the age of 25 years now manoj is thinking that i'll get very soon i'll get married then i'll have kids they will grow and when they attain the age of around 18 20 years i'll have to spend huge sum of money for their education then for getting them married so i will need huge amount of money when their age is between 20 to 25 at that point of time my age would be around 50 years or maybe between 50 and 55 so manoj is thinking that when he will be of 50 to 55 years of age he would require more amount of money with the intention to create some extra source of income during that phase of his life he can acquire an annuity policy right now his age is 25 years he wants money after the age of 50 years so he will buy a annuity policy for 25 years so from from the age of 26 years up to the age of 50 years he will go on contributing money to that annuity policy he will acquire an annuity plan of 25 years this annuity plan tenure can differ as per your requirement you can have an annuity plan of 10 years 15 years 20 years 25 years depending upon your requirement mano says that my requirement is i want an annuity plan from which i should get an annuity after I attain the age of 50 years. So Manoj has bought an annuity plan at the age of 25, having a tenure of 25 years. So for the next 25 years, Manoj will go on contributing money to that annuity plan. Once the tenure of 25 years is over, once the tenure of 25 years is over, Manoj will get annuity from that annuity, annuity plan. Annuity generally means annual amounts, but in certain cases you may also get half yearly amounts or quarterly amounts. In that case also that will be called as annuity. So in case of annuity plan, you go on investing for a certain span of time and on the completion of the tenure, once the plan, tenure of the plan comes to an end, thereafter you go on receiving the annuity. So this is totally similar to pension plan or pension scheme with slight difference. In pension plan, in pension plan, pension scheme, you receive money after you retire, that is after the age of 60 years. Whereas in annuity plan, you start receiving money when the term of an annuity plan comes to an end. Yes, have you understood annuity plan, annuity policy? This is also called as this is also called as deferred annuity plan. So it is as simple as planting a tree. Say for example, when you were of five years of age, you planted a mango tree. It took around 30 years for mango tree to grow. So when you are 40 years of age, you have a very big mango tree. And now you will always get free mangoes. So for 30 years, you invested your time, you invested your resources, you did the watering for the tree. And after 30 years, now tree is going to give you a fruits. So annuity plan is like planting a tree only. You plant a tree, you go on servicing the tree, do the watering for 20, 25 years. Once the term comes to an end, thereafter you will start getting the fruits in the form of annuity. So this is nothing but an annuity plan. 
which is similar to pension plan. Lot of financial institutions, lot of insurance companies, lot of mutual funds would offer you annuity plans. So if you invest money in those annuity plans, you can claim deduction in section ATC. Now let us try to understand what is the objective of life insurance policy. See objective of life insurance policy I had ex already explained you in the chapter of income from other sources. If you recollect in the chapter of income from other sources, I had explained you objective of life insurance policy. The purpose of taking life insurance policy is to ensure that your dependents are financially secured. When you take the life insurance policy, return on your investment will be very low. Say for example, you have paid a premium of 10 lakhs during a span of 20 years. Then at the end of 20 years, you will get somewhere around 12-13 lakhs. So return on the life insurance policy, if you go on calculating return on your investment, it will be very low. Because you don't take life insurance policy for earning good amount of return on your investment. You take life insurance policy for what? You take life insurance policy for providing financial security for your dependents. The objective is altogether different. If you want to earn heavy amount of return on your investment, if you want to earn decent or good amount of return on, an, on your investment, then you should acquire the units of mutual fund. You acquire the units of mutual fund. If you are a risk taker, acquire the units of equity oriented fund. You give your money to the mutual fund. They will invest money in equity shares. They will get good amount of return. You will also get good amount of return. So when you invest money in mutual fund, your intention is to get good return on your investment. Your intention is to get good return on your investment. But when you purchase life insurance policy, your purpose is to get financial security for your dependents. Your purpose is to get financial security for your dependents. Now, this mutual fund industry, they went to the investor saying that what is your requirement? Whether you want good return on your investment or whether you want financial security. What do you want? So that investor said, can't I get both? I want both. Can you give me both? So mutual fund industry came out with a new product, which is a combination of life insurance and investment in mutual fund. It's a combination of life insurance and investment in mutual fund. So a new product came into the market called as unit linked insurance plans. Unit linked insurance plans. So it is a combination of both. It, some part will be invested in life insurance policy. Some part will be invested in units. So it is a combination of both. So unit linked insurance plan, say for example, you are contributing 5,000 per month to unit linked insurance plan. Out of this 5,000, maybe for example, 3,000 is life insurance premium and 2,000 is invested in units of mutual fund. So what will happen in this case now? In case of unit linked insurance plan, your return on investment will be higher as compared to pure life insurance policies. In life insurance policy, in life insurance policy, your return on investment will be very low. If you acquire units of mutual fund, your return on investment in a long term will be very high. But if you acquire unit linked insurance plans, then your return on investment will be higher as compared to the life insurance policy 
and lower as compared to the units of mutual fund. So here your return on investment will be moderate. Means more as compared to pure insurance policies and less as compared to units of mutual fund. Have you understood this? What is the difference between life insurance policy, unit linked insurance plan and units of UTI? Now see point number 7. Contribution made by a person for participating in unit linked insurance plan of UTI. Who can claim deduction? Individual and HUF can claim deduction. See UTI is a mutual fund which was set up by the government of India, unit trust of India. So if you are investing money in unit linked insurance plan of UTI, you can claim deduction. But if you terminate that plan within 5 years, then whatever deduction was allowed to you, that will be added back to your income and tax will be levied. In case of life insurance policy, there is a lock-in period of 2 years. Don't terminate your policy within 2 years. Otherwise, what will happen? Whatever deduction you had claimed, that amount of deduction will be added back to your income and tax will be levied. Here, in case of unit linked insurance plan, there is a lock-in period of 5 years. Within a span of 5 years, if you surrender the unit linked insurance plan, then whatever deduction you had claimed in the last 5 years, everything will be added to your income and tax will be levied. This is point number 7. Next is point number 8. Contribution made by a person for participating in a unit linked insurance plan of LIC mutual fund. See, LIC of India is different and LIC mutual fund is different. <coughs> These are two different entities. LIC of India is into insurance business. LIC mutual fund, they are into mutual fund business. So, they are two different entities. Yes, LIC mutual fund is started by LIC of India only. So, LIC of India is a promoter for LIC mutual fund. But LIC mutual fund is a separate entity. They are into mutual fund business. So, if LIC mutual fund, they have come up with some unit linked insurance plan and you have invested money in that plan, you can claim deduction in section 80C. Who can claim deduction? Individual HF, both can claim deduction. Here also there is a locking period of 5 years. If you terminate that unit linked insurance plan before 5 years, then whatever deduction was allowed to you in the past, that deduction will be withdrawn and tax will be levied. For the time being, I am skipping point 9. First of all, let us move on to point 10, 11 and 12. I have already explained to you what is annuity plan. That I have already explained to you, annuity plan. Annuity plan, annuity scheme, deferred annuity policy, everything is same. So, annuity plan is a plan in which you go on investing for certain span of time. Thereafter, you go on receiving the annuity. So, if you have made a payment to annuity plan of LIC or any other insurance company, you have purchased an annuity plan from LIC of India or any other insurance company then you can claim deduction under section ATC. Who can claim deduction for point 10? Individual as well as HUF. Individual as well as HUF can claim deduction. Point 11 is payment made by an individual. <coughs> Rizwan life insurance policy lock-in period is 2 years. Means within two years you should not terminate the policy. Other investments generally it is five years. Shall I proceed? Point eleven. Payment made by an individual in respect of non-commutable deferred annuity scheme. Do you understand the word non-commutable? 
in the chapter of income from salary you had learned something called as commutation of pension what do you mean by commutation commutation means surrendering the monthly amount and getting the lump sum amount commutation means surrendering the monthly amount and getting the lump sum amount that is called as commutation of pension so commutation means surrendering monthly amount and getting the lump sum amount you can also commute certain deferred annuity policies so at the end of the tenure the moment you start on getting the annuity from the annuity plan you can surrender your annuity and get the lump sum amount government says we will give you deduction only if you are investing in non commutable deferred annuity schemes means there should not be option to commute there should not be a option to commute so that policy or plan should be non commutable so point number 11 only individual can claim deduction payment is made by an individual in respect of non commutable deferred annuity scheme if an individual can claim deduction he can claim deduction for investment made in the name of self or spouse and children so this is your point number 11 now we have point number 12 contribution by an individual by way of deduction from salary salary payable to him by the government to an individual for the purpose of securing him a deferred annuity or making provision for his wife and children so first of all point number 12 only individual can claim deduction and very important only government employee can claim deduction only government employee can claim deduction see there are certain deferred annuity schemes which are run by the government similar to provident fund the, the way they deduct some portion from your salary and invest in provident fund for your benefit similarly there might be some deferred annuity schemes wherein government will deduct some amount of portion of salary from the employees payment and that will be invested into deferred annuity schemes whatever amount is deducted from his salary it is his own contribution to that deferred annuity scheme he can claim deduction in section 80c deduction should not exceed 1/5 of salary deduction should not exceed 1/5 of salary so here we have completed point number 10 11 12 all these points are related to deferred annuity schemes these are related to deferred annuity schemes then point number 9 we have equity linked saving scheme point number 9 we have equity linked saving scheme see you have a saving account with bank na in that saving account you can deposit whatever amount you want you can deposit 50 rupees 100 rupees 500 rupees at at whatever interval you want if you have find a deposit go and deposit in your saving account now if you need you can withdraw you can deposit any amount irrespective of any interval also you may deposit 500 rupees in this month next to two months you need not deposit anything so there is no restriction whatever savings you have you go and deposit in that savings account similarly there is a savings account for investment in units of mutual fund there is a savings account for investment in mutual fund units so mutual fund has started with something called as equity linked saving scheme wherein you will open an account with the mutual fund now this month if you are having 2000 rupees you go and give 2000 to mutual fund that mutual fund will see whatever is the nav do you understand na nav net asset value say for example in the month of january you gave 2000 rupees to that mutual fund and the nav of unit was 20 rupees 
So 2000 divided by 20, whatever number of units is arrived, that many number of units will be credited to your ELSS account. Next month you did not have any money, you could not save anything, don't deposit any money. Once again next month you had only 1000 rupees, go and give 1000 rupees to mutual fund. 1000 rupees divided by whatever NAV is going on, on that particular date. They will find out the number of units and that many number of units will be credited to your account. So ELSS is basically investment in the units of mutual fund. But investment at your own convenience for the amount whichever you have saved. There is no restriction that you should invest only this much amount. Only at a regular interval of, interval of one month. It, it, it is all upon you. You can invest whatever amount you want and whenever you want. So contribution to notified equity link saving scheme of mutual fund or UTI. This should be notified scheme. Generally all are notified. Generally all are notified only. So this is point number 9. So till now we have completed point number up to point number 12. Now next to 3 points. That is point number 13, 14 and 15. Point number 13, 14 and 15 are related to housing. They are related to what? They are related to housing. For example, let us move on to first, let us move on to point number 15. This I have already explained you when we were in the chapter of income from house property. If you have taken any loan, if you have taken any loan related to housing, then you will pay EMI to the bank or financial institution. That EMI would consist of principal and interest. Interest you can claim it as deduction under section 24 clause B. Whereas principal you can claim it as deduction in section 80C. So here we have point number 15. We need to understand the clear distinction between section 24 clause B and the section 80C. Point number 15. So what I will do now? I will read this point number 15 for you and then we will apply our mind. I have already made a distinction for you. There are a lot of distinction points. Examiner will try to fool the students in those, in those points. So we will understand that. So you can mark this as the most important point out of, of entire 23 points. Life insurance premium point number 1 and this point number 15 both are very important. Any specified payment, any specified payment made by a person, person means individual and HUF. Dikshit, they are not using the word repayment of, uh, uh, definitely repayment of principal amount is covered here. But besides that, something else also is covered. Let us read this. Any specified payment. What is specified payment? Specified payment can be any of following two. Number one, repayment of housing loan. When we say repayment, it is always principal amount only. See, principal is repaid. Interest is paid. Interest is not repaid. There is a difference between payment and repayment. Repayment means whatever amount you have taken, you are returning back. And payment means you are giving interest on that. So, repayment of housing loan, you can claim reduction. Number 2, you can claim deduction for stamp duty. Do you recollect the chapter of capital gain, section 50C, stamp duty value? On that, you pay stamp duty whenever you enter into a sale transaction, purchase transaction of immobile property, you pay stamp duty to the state government. That stamp duty can also be claimed as deduction. Registration fees. See, when you purchase the immobile property, you register the agreement with the register of properties. There also you have to pay registration fees, which is around 1%. Stamp duty is 5 to 6% in different, different states. 
it is in the range of 5 to 6 percentage everywhere and the registration charges are 1 percentage of the agreement value. That registration fees also you can claim it as deduction. So, the word specified payment will include three things. Number one, repayment of housing loan. Number two, stamp duty. And number three, registration fees. So, any specified payment made by a person towards what? Towards the cost of purchase. Towards the cost of purchase or construction of new residential house property. Of new residential house property. Cost of purchase, cost of construction. Of new residential house property. Income from which is taxable under IFSP. Income from which is taxable under IFSP. Now specified payment will include repayment of housing loan. Housing loan taken from whom? Housing loan taken from central government. State government, if you are a government employee, you can get loan from government also. Central government, state government, bank, LIC, approved long-term housing finance companies, cooperative society, self-financing scheme of any board or authority. Board or authority means housing board. See, in Maharashtra, we have Mahada. In Maharashtra, we have Mahada, M-H-A-D-A. Maharashtra Housing and Development Authority. Similarly, in Gujarat, they have Gujarat Housing Board. What is the job of these housing boards? Na? Their job is to construct the houses and sell those houses to people at a very low price, at a very concessional price, at no profit, no loss. So, in Tamil Nadu also, you might be having some government, state government's entity called as housing board. So, if you have taken loan from housing board and you are repaying the loan, that principal amount can also be claimed as deduction. Employer who is a public company or public sector company, if you have taken loan for purchase the house from your employer, repayment of principal amount can be claimed as deduction. University, college, authority or board or corporation established under central state act etc. See, all teachers and other staff members working with college, university, may also get some loan from them for purchasing the property. In that case, they would repay the principal amount to university, college, etc. They can claim the deduction. Dikshit, I will take your point. Wait, wait a minute. Stamp duty registration fees is allowed as deduction, provided such property is not transferred within 5 years from the date of purchase, within 5 years from the date of purchase. If you sell the property within 5 years from the date of purchase, then whatever deduction was allowed to you with respect to stamp duty and registration fees, that amount will be added back to your income and tax will be levied. And tax will be levied. Yes, have you understood this? Yes or no? Yes or no? So now we'll try to understand section twenty four clause B. And section 80C point number 15, what is the difference? What is the difference between section 24 clause B and section 80C point number 15? That is what we will try to understand. This is point number 15, not 14.
Okay. Now listen to me carefully. I have made a distinction of 10 points between section 24 clause B and section 80C point number 15. Point number 1, section 24 clause B, any person can claim deduction. If a partnership firm has taken loan for purchase of property and a partnership firm is paying the interest, they can also claim deduction. They can also claim deduction. Section 80C only individual HUF can claim deduction. Section 80C only individual HUF can claim deduction. No one else. Section 24B deduction is allowed on accrual basis. Whereas Section 80C deduction is allowed on payment basis. Section 80C, sorry, Section 24B deduction is allowed for interest on loan. Whereas section 80C deduction is allowed for specified payment. The word specified payment includes repayment of principal amount of loan. Number one, it includes repayment of principal amount of loan. Number two, it includes the stamp duty. Number two, it includes stamp duty. And number three, it includes the registration fees. So you can claim deduction for three things when it comes to section 80C point number 15. Section 24 clause B, you can claim deduction for interest if the loan is taken either for acquisition of property or for construction of property or for repairs of property or renovation of property or reconstruction of property. If you have taken loan for acquisition, construction, repairs, renovation or reconstruction of property, you can claim deduction for it. So, you might have taken for any of these purposes. You might have taken loan for any of these purposes. This interest can be claimed as deduction in section 24, class B. But if you refer to section 80C very carefully, what words they are using? They are using the word cost of purchase or construction. They have not used the word repairs, renovation, etc. They have just used the words cost of purchase or cost of construction. So, refer to that page number 282. Refer to that line number 3 on the left hand side. Cost of purchase or construction. So, there they have not used the word repairs, renovation or reconstruction. So, if you want deduction in section 80C with respect to repayment of principal amount, stamp duty registration fees, you are, you should take the loan either for acquisition or for construction of property. Loan taken for acquisition or construction of property, then only you can claim deduction for repayment of principal amount. Yes, is that very, very clear? Yes or no? See, generally this distinction I give as a homework to the students and we generally discuss in the next lecture. But this time I am discussing right away with in our normal discussion. Only. Section 24 class B, you can claim deduction for interest on loan irrespective of the nature of property. That property can be a residential property or it can be a commercial property. Say for example, I have purchased one premises in a commercial complex. I have taken a loan for that. I have let out that premises. I will earn rental income. That rental income will be taxable to me under income from house property. While calculating that income from house property, I can claim deduction for interest on loan. So, property can be residential or commercial in house property, but here it has to be a residential property only. It has to be a residential property because that is what is clearly written cost of purchase or construction of new residential property they have clearly used the word residential property your interest is a deduction from income from house property whereas this section etc is deduction from your gross total income is gross total income section 24 clause b you can take deduction for interest on loan irrespective from whom you have taken the loan. 
if you recollect in the chapter of income from house property we had discussed some important points with respect to deduction of interest on loan in that one of the point was loan can be taken from any person if you have taken loan from bank financial institution friend relative any other person you can claim deduction with respect to interest on loan so you can take loan from any person but if you want deduction for the principal repayment if you want deduction for principal repayment then you have to take loan only from a specified person what do you mean by specified person that list we saw right now in section 80c specified person means central government state government bank lic approved long term housing finance companies cooperative society self financing scheme of any bank, any board authority employer who is a company public company public sector company university college authority or board or corporation established under central or state act this is the list of specified person so if you have taken loan from your friend if you have taken loan from your relative then you can claim deduction for interest but principal repayment deduction will not be allowed principal repayment deduction is not allowed dikshit your point is covered your point is covered point number 8 section 24 clause b deduction for interest on loan in case of self occupied property there is a maximum limit for claiming deduction of interest on loan that is either 30000 or if four conditions are fulfilled 2 lakhs if four conditions are fulfilled 2 lakhs in case of let out property there is no limit with respect to deduction of interest on loan you can claim deduction for any amount of interest section 80c there is no specific limit for claiming deduction of principal amount of repayment of housing loan there is no specific limit but there is a overall limit and that overall limit is how much 150000 overall limit is 150000 that limit is definitely applicable point number 9 section 24 clause b deduction with respect to interest on loan once the deduction is allowed to you thereafter it can never be withdrawn in the subsequent year <clears throat> once the deduction is allowed to you it can never be withdrawn in the subsequent year but here whatever deduction is allowed to you deduction with respect to stamp duty registration fees if you have claimed deduction for stamp duty and registration fees and if you sell the property within 5 years then that amount of deduction will be added back to your income and tax will be levied deduction will be will be withdrawn if the property is sold within 5 years and now we move on to the last point that is section 24 clause b here your deduction can be more than the income your deduction can be more than the income in other words your income will be negative in that case so you can have losses but section 80c if you have a gross total income of 1 lakh you can't claim deduction of 1 lakh 15 section 80c because your deduction will be restricted to the amount of your income so deduction cannot be more than the income which is taxable at slab rates so friends i have discussed 10 different points for you i have discussed 10 different points clearly giving you the distinction between section 24 clause b and section 80c the most favorite point for the examiner to ask you would be point number 4 point number 7 point number 4 point number 7 i'll add one more point to this i have given 10 points here let me add one more point here this if you want you can write 
because the notes which I will be sending you will be having only 10 points. So, I am adding one more point here. Do you recollect in the chapter of income from house property, we have discussed that interest can be either a pre-construction interest or post-construction interest. Yes or no? Interest can be either pre-construction interest or post-construction interest. Deduction is allowed for which interest? Pre-construction or post-construction? Deduction is allowed for both interest. Pre-construction interest deduction is allowed in five equal annual installments. We know pre-construction interest deduction is allowed in five equal annual installments. Post-construction interest deduction is allowed at one go. Post-construction interest deduction is allowed at one go. So, Pre-construction period, your pre-construction period will start on which date? Date of loan or date of starting of construction. This you can copy on. Huh? Whichever is later. Whichever is later. Your pre construction period will start on date of loan or date of starting of construction, whichever is later. It will end on which date? It will end on 31st March. Immediately preceding the date of completion of construction. It will end on 31st March. Immediately Preceding the date of completion of construction. The time gap between these two dates is called as pre-construction period. This time gap between these two dates is called as what? Pre-construction period. During this period, repayment of loan. If there is a repayment of loan during this period, during this pre-construction period, that will also be divided in divided in two parts, right? Principal as well as interest. Yes, principal, what will happen? Principal deduction is not allowed. Principal deduction is not allowed. This is the most important point. Interest deduction is allowed in five equal annual installments. Interest deduction is allowed in five equal annual installments. So, this you can take it as point number 11.
how do you come to know that principal deduction is not allowed? Yes. Look at the language of the provision. What it says? Any specified payment made by a person towards cost of purchase or construction of new residential house property, income from which is chargeable to tax under the IFSP. Income from which is chargeable to tax under the IFSP. When your income is chargeable to tax under the IFSP, only when the construction of property is completed. In other words, deduction under section 80C will be allowed only when the construction of property is completed. Thereafter, you are making repayment of loan. Therefore, therefore we say that the pre-construction period, na, whatever interest you pay will be accumulated and will be given to as deduction in five equal annual installments starting from the year of completion of construction. But principal repayment during that period will not be allowed as deduction. Have you understood this point very clearly? Yes? So this is also one of the important points. So I have given you the list of some important points. So this point number 11 is important. Besides, point number 7, 4, these are important. Point number 4, 7 and 11, these are most important points. <clears throat> Rest all is just an analysis. Have you understood very clearly distinction between section 24 clause B, section 50, uh, uh, section 80C point number 15. See this analysis you can also do. Provided you have understood the provision very clearly. Why there is a need to do such a detailed analysis? Na? Because examiners are asking questions from those analysis. And such kind of analysis is nowhere given. Neither it is given in the ICI module nor it is given in any other author's textbook. So, and the student do not have the tendency to read the provisions between the lines. So, and you are learning this subject for the first time in your life. You are learning this subject for the first time in your life. An examiner, they are playing with the psychology. They are taking the undue advantage. They are asking questions from such kind of analytical points only. So, you should be very careful. Day for exam, you have to refer those three points, point number 4, 7 and 11. So with this, I have completed point number 15. Now we have two more points which are related to housing and those are very simple point, point number 13 and point number 14. Now my very simple question to you is, uh, do you know HDFC, HDFC? HDFC is a housing finance company. HDFC is a housing finance company. HDFC is bank also. There are some housing finance companies, there are banks. Now, what is the job of a housing finance company? The job of a housing finance company is to provide the funds for construction or purchase or residential houses in India. Job of the housing finance company is to provide the long term funds for purchase or construction of residential houses in India. Now the question is from where they will get the funds? The housing finance company will provide funds to people in the form of loan. But from where they will get the funds? They will get the funds by the deposit schemes. The way you deposit your money with the bank. Similarly, housing finance companies would also come up with deposit schemes. Wherein you can keep your money as fixed deposit with housing finance companies. And you can earn some decent amount of interest. And that money will be used by housing finance companies for providing the loan to those people who want to purchase or construct the house. So housing finance companies 
would raise funds by way of issuing deposits. Principal amount not allowed as such in section 80C. Rizwan is asking me question, sir. Principal amount of EMI is not allowed as such in section 80C. Is it correct? Principal amount is allowed as such. It is not allowed only if it is pertaining to pre-construction period. If it is pertaining to post-construction period, yes, it is allowed as such. Rizwan, have you understood? Yes or no? If your principal repayment pertains to pre-construction period, then it is not allowed, not allowed as such. But if your principal repayment pertains to post-construction period, then it is allowed as deduction. Then it is allowed as such. So we have completed point number 15. Point number 13 we are moving on to. I told you that housing finance company would raise the funds by offering deposits. So they would accept money by deposits and they will use this money for providing loan to people. Similarly, there is housing authority. There are housing authority or housing boards. I told you in Gujarat, there is a government entity called as Gujarat Housing Board. In Maharashtra, there is a government entity, state government entity, entity called as Mahara. So all these housing authorities or, or housing boards, they will construct houses and they will sell houses to people at no profit, no loss. Their sole purpose is to fulfill the need of housing. Every state is having such housing board and housing authority. What housing authority will do? Na? They will purchase a plot of land. On that they will construct a building. Once the building is constructed, by the lottery system they will allot the houses. So you have to apply. If your application is selected in the lottery, you will be given the house. Not free of cost. You have to pay money for it. But they will sell it at no profit, no loss. Means the prices would be low. Say for example, if you purchase 2 BHK flat from builder, he may charge you 50 lakh rupees. That same flat, you may get it at 35 lakhs, 38 lakhs from the housing authority or housing board. But they will give you those flats by lottery system. What builder is doing now? Builder will ask for money from you at a regular intervals. As and, when, as and when the construction progresses, he will expect you to pay money. So basically, he will do the construction with your own money. With your own, your money only, he will do the construction and he will give the flat to you. But these housing boards, housing authorities, they will invest their own money. They will purchase the plot of land. On that, they will construct the building. Then they will sell that building to the citizens. So, they have to invest money initially. Na? From where they will get the money? They will also come out with deposit schemes. So, say for example, in Maharashtra, Mahara has come out with a deposit scheme, Mahara. I will invest money in deposit scheme of Mahara. I will get deduction in section 80C. I will get interest also on that. Mahara will use these funds for the construction of building. They will construct the building, they will sell the building to whoever person wants it and they will earn only that much amount of profit which is sufficient enough to pay the interest cost, that's all. So, this housing finance companies, these housing finance companies and these housing authorities would come up with deposit schemes. They would come up with deposit schemes. If you invest money in the deposit schemes of housing finance company and housing authority, then you can claim deduction in section ATC. Who can claim deduction in point number 50 or 13? Individual as well as HF. Point number 15, definitely individual as well as HF. 
Now we have one more point, point number 14. This is also related to housing. We have something called as National Housing Bank. We have something called as National Housing Bank. Do you know NABAD, NABAD, National Bank for Agricultural and Rural Development? What is the objective of setting up NABAD? What is the purpose of NABAD? They will provide funds for what? For agricultural and rural development. They will provide funds for agricultural and rural development. Similarly, we have something called as National Housing Bank. You have heard now, NHAI, National Highway Authority of India. They will provide funding for construction of highways in India. Similarly, we have a bank called as National Housing Bank. They will provide funds for what? For construction or purchase of residential houses in India. How they would raise the funds? By deposit schemes only. This National Housing Bank will also raise the funds by deposit scheme. So, if you invest money in the deposit scheme of National Housing Bank, you can claim deduction. You can claim deduction. If you have taken loan from National Housing Bank and you are repaying, you can claim deduction for principal and interest. Where in point 15? But point 14 doesn't talk about repayment. Point 14 talks about investment. Any sum paid by a person, including interest, as subscription to home loan account scheme of National Housing Bank. Is that very clear? So, point number 13, 14, 15, they are connected to housing, they are related to housing. These points are over. Now, we are left with small, small points, we will get completed. One point will take maximum one minute's time. Point number 16, there is something called as National Saving Scheme. National Saving Scheme. So, uh, not National Saving Scheme, National Saving Certificate. National Saving Certificate. See, National Saving Scheme was started in the year 1987. It got uh, uh, expired in 1992. National Saving Scheme is something else. This is National Saving Certificate. If you invest money in National Saving Certificate, you can claim deduction in Section ATC. Who can claim deduction? Individual and HUF can claim deduction. Individual can invest money in his own name or in the name of spouse or children. HUF can invest money in the name of any member of family. Whatever interest is accrued, na, whatever interest is accrued on this national saving certificate, that interest also gets automatically reinvested in that same national saving certificate. In accountancy, you might have learned na, sinking fund investment. In the depreciation chapter, you might have learned a sinking fund investment. Whatever interest you get on that fund, on that investment, will also get automatically reinvested. Na. Similarly, here also, National Savings Certificate, whatever interest you receive, na, will automatically be reinvested in the same National Savings Certificate. That reinvestment will also be eligible for deduction under Section ADC. That reinvestment will also be eligible for deduction under Section ATC. So, accrued interest is also eligible for deduction. <coughs> accrued interest is also eligible for deduction. See, I have taken an example here to make you understand. I have example number two here for understanding deduction for investment made in National Savings Certificate 8th issue. I am just giving an example. Don't try to confirm this with what is there in the practical life. National Savings Certificate. National Savings Certificate. This I will explain you. The term of National Savings Certificate. Term of National Savings Certificate is Six years. Term of 
National Saving Certificate is 6 years. 10 year of National Saving Certificate is 6 years. For example, the rate of interest is at 10% per annum simple interest. You have invested such 50,000 rupees. What would be your deduction under section 80C? Year number 1, at the beginning of year number 1, you invested 50,000 rupees. At the beginning of year number 1, you invested 50,000 rupees. For this 50,000, you can claim deduction in section 80C. For this 50,000, you can claim deduction in section 80C. Now you will receive interest on this 50,000 at 10 percentage. That is 5,000 rupees. This 5,000 per annum interest is accrued to you. What will be the tax treatment of this interest? This 5,000 interest is taxable to you under the income from other sources. Listen to me carefully. This 5,000 interest is taxable to you under the income from other sources. This interest also gets automatically reinvested in the same national saving certificate and therefore you can also claim deduction under section 80C for this. So from year number 1 to year number 5, tenure of the NAC is say for example 6 years. So from year number 1 to year number 5, interest will get accrued and that same amount of interest will get reinvested also. So whatever interest is accrued will become taxable to you under income from other sources and whatever and the same amount of interest gets reinvested. So for that you can claim deduction in section 80C. So this treatment will be given for year number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the 5 years. Every year interest will get accrued, it will be added to your IFO's income and you will claim deduction in section 80C. Is that very clear? Yes or no? Last year, last year, say for example, National Saving Certificate is issued to you for 6 years. Then in year number 6, you will get an interest at 5000 per annum. But this interest will not get reinvested because now it is the time of maturity. Now it is the time of maturity this will not get reinvested. So, this 5000 will be taxable to you under the income from other sources, but since this is not getting reinvested for year number 6, interest will not be allowed as deduction to you in section 80C. Now, listen to me carefully, examiner will give you interest on national saving certificate in, in the question. Examiner will give you interest on national saving certificate in the question. But he will not tell you whether this is the interest for year number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 or whether it is the interest for year number 6. So what you have to assume? You have to assume that this interest is either for year number 1, 2, 3 or 3, 4 or 5. In other words, you should add that amount of interest to income from other sources and should also claim it as deduction under section 80C. You should add the amount of interest to income from other sources and you should also claim it as deduction under section 80C. So this was point number 16. This was point number 16. You go through point number 17 quickly. To go through point number 17, I am giving you one minute's time. Go through point number 17.
Yes. Have you referred to point 17? Deva is asking question. Sir, if question is silent, then we should assume that entire interest is reinvested. Yes. If question is silent, then yes, entire interest is reinvested. Because it gets automatically reinvested. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to do anything. It automatically gets reinvested there only. So, it will never be received by you. Interest will be received along with the principal amount at the time of maturity. It will be received along with the principal at the time of maturity. Yes, is that very clear? Okay. Point number 17. When a person is investing money in senior citizen saving scheme, he can claim reduction. The senior citizen saving scheme, only a senior citizen person can invest. HCS can never be a senior citizen. Only individual can be a senior citizen. So, point number 17, only individual can claim deduction. Only individual can claim deduction. Payment made by a person. But this word person, na, don't get misled by this. More important words are senior citizen. Age should be 60 or more. 60 or more. Therefore, only an individual can claim deduction. HUS cannot. And there is a lock-in period of 5 years. If you invest money in senior citizen saving scheme, if you invest money in senior citizen saving scheme, and if you take exit from the scheme before 5 years, then whatever deduction was allowed to you will be withdrawn. Whatever deduction was allowed to you will be withdrawn. Dixit is asking me question, sir, if interest is not reinvested, then what? No, Dixit, interest will be reinvested because you don't have option whether to, whether to reinvest the interest or not to reinvest. It gets automatically reinvested there only. Dixit, interest gets automatically reinvested. You don't have a right to take interest. Interest will be given to you only at the time of maturity. Dikshir, have you understood? So, it will get automatically reinvested. It will get automatically reinvested and you can claim deduction under section ATC. Only in the last year of NAC investments, deduction will not be allowed for interest under Section ATC because in last year it will not get reinvested. So, point number 17 also we have done. Invest money in senior citizen saving scheme with post office. You can claim deduction. Lock in period is 5 years. Lock in period is 5 years. So, if you invest money in senior citizen saving scheme and if you withdraw money before completion of 5 years, whatever deduction you have claimed, that amount will be added back to your income and tax will be levied. Point number 18 19 is very simple. If you have kept a term deposit, term deposit is nothing but a fixed deposit. If you have kept a term deposit for a period of 5 years or more, with whom? With a scheduled bank. Scheduled bank means list of bank is given by RBI. If the name of bank appears in that list, that bank will be called a scheduled bank. So, if you have invested money in term deposit of a scheduled bank and the tenure of that deposit is 5 years or more, then you can claim deduction in section ATC. Here who can claim deduction? Individual as well as HUS. Similarly, you have term deposit with post office. Post office term deposit rules 1981. If you recollect, interest on that post office term deposit is totally exempt in section 10 clause 15. 
that is what we had discussed in the chapter of income from other sources whatever interest you own in post office term deposit that interest is exempt in section 10 clause 15 and whatever money you invest in this term deposit will be allowed to be as deduction provided the tenure is 5 years or more who can claim deduction individual and hf can claim deduction individual and hf can claim deduction what is the lock in period it is implied it is 5 years it is 5 years so this is about point number 18 and 19 term deposit 5 years or more with schedule bank term deposit 5 years or more with post office time with post office under post office time deposit rules 1981 point number 20 yesterday itself i spoke to you about this point point number 20 deposit made by the parent or a legal guardian of a girl child under sukanya samridhi account scheme so you can open a account with the post office under sukanya samridhi account scheme this account can be opened for the benefit of girl child you go on depositing money you can claim deduction in section 80c once the girl child attains the age of majority you can withdraw money and you can use that funds for her education or for her marriage so whatever amount you invest in this sukanya samridhi account scheme for the benefit of girl child that amount you can claim it as deduction in section 80c and at the time of maturity, whatever amount you will get, that will be totally exempt from tax. In section 10, clause 11a, it will be exempt from tax in section 10, clause 11a. So, this was point number 2020. Now, we have point number 21. Point number 21, here you are having a space on page 284. Eighteen point also, yes, there is a lock-in period. There is one. Eighteen point also. See, lock-in period means what? You, you should not break the lock-in period. If you will break the lock-in period, then what will happen? Whatever deduction was allowed to you, that deduction will be withdrawn and that amount will be added to your income. So, definitely in point number 18 also there is a lock-in period of 5 years. So, term deployed for a period of 5 years or more. So, by, by default there is a lock-in period of 5 years. See, point number 21 you are having some space here on page 284. Is that clear? Now, can you see properly? For point number 21, you can write infrastructure bonds, debentures, shares. You can write infrastructure, bonds, debentures and shares. Here there is a lock-in period of 3 years. What is this infrastructure, bonds, debentures and shares? See, every country should have a good quality of infrastructure means good roads 24 by 7 water supply good quality of water proper supply of electricity all these things should be there proper transportation public transportation system so for developing this infrastructure see highways so all these things are infrastructure part of infrastructure for developing this infrastructure you need huge amount of money to ensure that money will always be available 
government has come out with a deduction in section 80c so every person every year would like to claim deduction in section 80c so he may invest money one of the avenue of investment is you invest money in infrastructure bonds shares and debentures so if you invest money in the debenture of any company and that that company in turn in, is investing money in infrastructure or that company is providing loan long term loan for construction of highways for power generation plants etc then we say that you have invested money in infrastructure so if you are investing money for infrastructure development you are not investing money directly but indirectly your funds are rooted for infrastructure development so you have invested money in infrastructure bonds debentures shares you can claim deduction point number 21 point number 20 who can claim deduction point number 20 individual can claim deduction because they are using the word parent or legal heir parent or sorry parent or legal guardian not the legal heir parent or legal guardian point number 21 individual hf both can claim deduction then we have point number 22 notified bonds of nabard this bond should be notified most of them would be notified who can claim deduction individual hf can claim deduction individual hf can claim deduction now we'll move on to the last point that is point number 23 this is last but the most important point this is one of the important point i told you life insurance policy premium is important point repayment of housing loan etc point number 15 is important point this point is also important point because examiner will try to fool you why na you have not we have not learned the section 80c a 80e yet when we learn 80e we will, i will try to compare section 80c point number 23 with the section 80e so today i'll give you homework today i'll give i'm giving you homework you have to find out what is the difference between So you have to find out what is the difference between section 80C point number 23, section 80C point number 23 versus section 80E versus section 80E. this distinction you take it as part of homework and you try to find out what is the difference i'll explain you at point number 80c today you have to read section 80e in that section 80e is given on page number 290 that's given on page number 290 dikshit is asking me sir that limit is applicable to each of the points dikshit everywhere you don't have a specific limit life insurance premium you are having a specific limit contribution to deferred and the scheme by the government employee you are having a specific limit certain points are having specific limit most of the points are not having specific limit but overall limit of 1 lakh 50 is applicable to all the points and this 1 lakh 50 is not per point it is combined investment of all 23 points not separately it is overall if you consider it separately then how much deduction will people will be in a position to claim 23 point multiply by 1 and 1/2 lakh no one would pay tax in this country then which is yes point number 23 listen to me carefully first of all who can claim deduction that is what you have to find out 
Deduction is allowed for what? Tuition fees. Tuition fees. Excluding donation development fees. So you can claim deduction for tuition fees. If you have say, say for example, you have done a personality development course or personality grooming course. You cannot claim deduction for that. You can claim deduction only for tuition fees. No deduction for development fees, donation, etc. Tuition fees paid by an individual. Tuition fees paid by an individual. Only individual can claim deduction. HUF cannot claim deduction. Only individual will be allowed deduction. Tuition fees paid to any university, college, school or other educational institution. Can you claim deduction for the tuition fees which you are paying to inside commerce studies? No. Because it is a private institution. Tuition fees which you might have paid to your college. Say for example, first year of BCom, you have paid a tuition fees to your college. Can you claim deduction? Yes. Because that is an approved institution. And mind you, Whatever fees you have paid to your college, na, entire amount cannot be claimed as deduction. If you refer to the fee receipt carefully, na, tuition fees is only 800 rupees. For the entire year, BCom course, tuition fees is only 800 rupees. You might have paid around 3,500 to 4,000. But in that 3,500 to 4,000, tuition fees is only 800 rupees. Rest all are library fees, gymkhana fees. They charge you money by different different names. But tuition fees, what they can charge, what they are charging is only 800. Can you claim deduction for the fees paid by you to CA Institute? No. Because they are not providing any tuition to you. So the fees which you have paid to them, na, that does not include any tuition fees. So, tuition fees can be claimed as such. Donation development fees cannot be claimed as such. See, I am giving you some important points. I am analyzing the sentence. This entire point number 23, I am doing analysis for you. Important point number 1. Tuition fees can be claimed as such. Donation development fees cannot be claimed as such. Important point number 2. Individual can claim deduction. HEF cannot claim deduction. Important point number three, fees paid to recognized, approved, university, college, other ed educational institution can be claimed as deduction. Tuition fees paid to private institutions, coaching classes cannot be claimed as deduction. This is the important point number three. Important point number four, this educational institution should be situated within India. If you are going to UK for doing MBA, MBA course, then tuition fees paid to that UK university, you cannot claim as reduction. That educational institution should be situated within India. So if the educational institution situa is situated within India, whatever tuition fees you pay can be claimed as reduction in section 86. But if the educational institution is situated outside India, Tuition fees paid cannot be claimed as such. This is important point number four. Important point number five. The course which you are doing, doing should be a full-time course. Should be a full-time course. Do you know CA is a part-time course? CA is a part-time course. And FY become is a full-time course. CA is a part-time course. And your FY become, become is a full-time course. You are devoting full-time to CA. But CA is a part-time course. Full-time course means they are providing you tuition. Then it is a full-time course. CA institute is not providing you any tuition. You have to just register, pay the registration fees. They will send you the books. That's all. It is a postal course, means course content will be sent to you by post, 
and you appear for the exam. That's all. CA is a part time course, FY become is a full time course. So, tuition fees reduction will be allowed only if it is a full time course. See, examiners are very smart, they would give tuition fees for part time course. If you just remember tuition fees, then you will claim deduction in section 80C. But you have to also remember tuition fees for full time course. Tuition fees for full time education of any two children. See, at the beginning of section 80C, I told you that individual can claim deduction for investment made or expenditure incurred for self, spouse, and children. But this point number 23 individual can claim deduction that too only for children and that too maximum to see just just two sentences i have extracted six important points examiner would try to ask you question out of these points only he'll he'll say tuition fees paid for the education of spouse if you claim deduction, you are gone. He will say tuition fees paid for part-time course. If you claim deduction, you are gone. Tuition fees paid for to private coaching for C intermediate tuition. If you claim deduction, you are gone. See, they will play with your mind. They will use the word tuition fees and then they will use some words which will throw you out of the section. So, you can't claim deduction for tuition fees. If you just look at the tuition fees word, you will claim deduction. So, this is point number 23. With this, section ATC comes to an end. Point number 3 says, deduction is on actual payment. Point number 4 says, quantum of deduction will be actual investment made or 150, whichever is lower. Private schools. See, private schools are approved by the government. The private schools which you are talking about, they are approved by the government. They are approved by the government and tuition fees is also approved by the government. See, schools will charge you tuition fees as per the government guidelines. But when the school is charging a very heavy amount of fees, na, they will charge you fees for bus service, for dress, for library, they will charge you fees with different different names. But if that school is approved, recognized, then tuition fees will be as per the guidelines only. Every state board, na, every state board will have some guidelines. Schools can charge only that much amount of fees, which is given in that guidelines. Whatever extra they are charging, they are not charging for tuition fees. They are charging in some other name. So, there is nothing called as private school. You use, instead of using the word private school, the right word is approved or unapproved. Approved or unapproved. Recognized or unrecognized. If, the, if that particular school is recognized, approved school, approved by the uh, Tamil Nadu Education Board, then even though it is a private school, it is approved by Tamil Nadu Education Board, na? they will charge tuition fees as per their guidelines only. They cannot charge extra. Have you understood, Deva? Yes? So, point number 3 says that deduction is allowed on actual payment. Point number 4 says that quantum of deduction cannot exceed 1 lakh 50,000. With this, our discussion of section ADC is over. In these notes, na, I have summarized the section ADC. I have summarized the section ADC into five broad points. Into five broad points. First point is LIC. First point is LIC. Second point, second category in fact. Second category is investment for your future. Where you will invest money for your bright future? Future means after you retire, you should have good amount of money. Na? So, where you will invest money for a bright future? You may invest money in pension fund, provident fund. It can be statutory provident fund. 
रेकग्नाइज प्रोविडेंट फंड पब्लिक प्रोविडेंट फंड अप्रूव सुपरेंशन फंड म्यूचुअल फंड म्यूचुअल फंड यू कैन हैव टू स्कीम्स यूनिट लिंक इंश्योरेंस प्लान इक्विटी लिंक सेविंग स्कीम एंड यू कैन इन्वेस्ट मनी इन डिफॉल्ट एनवर्टी स्कीम्स सो दिस इज द सेकंड कैटेगरी ऑफ इन्वेस्टमेंट वेयर वेयर यू आर इन्वेस्टिंग फॉर योर ब्राइट फ्यूचर थर्ड कैटेगरी इज द इन्वेस्टमेंट व्हिच यू नॉर्मली डू थ्रू पोस्ट ऑफिस इन्वेस्टमेंट व्हिच यू नॉर्मली डू थ्रू पोस्ट ऑफिस लाइक नेशनल सेविंग सर्टिफिकेट एट इशू सीनियर सिटीजन सेविंग स्कीम पोस्ट ऑफिस टाइम डिपॉजिट फॉर ए पीरियड ऑफ फाइव इयर्स और मोर सुकन्या समृद्धि अकाउंट स्कीम एंड अलॉन्ग विद एडेड टाइम डिपॉजिट विद शेड्यूल बैंक फाइव इयर्स और मोर सिंस बोथ आर टाइम डिपॉजिट ना आई टेकन टूगेदर यू सो पॉइंट नंबर थ्री यू कैन कैटेगराइज एज इन्वेस्टमेंट थ्रू पोस्ट ऑफिस नेशनल सेविंग स्कीम सीनियर सिटीजन सेविंग स्कीम uh time deposit for 5 years or more with post office with schedule bank and sukanya samriddhi account scheme point number 4 or category number 4 category 4 is relating to housing see this serial number of the points na they are not correctly given it is from 13 to 15 and is from point number 13 to 15 3 points relating to housing investment in the deposit scheme of housing finance company and housing authority housing boards then investment in the deposit scheme of national housing bank and repayment of principal amount of housing loan stamp duty registration fees those three points are relating to housing and the last category is residual category residual category means those points which do not fall into four earlier categories you can remember it as three words int int i is infrastructure bonds n is nabad bonds and t is tuition fees infrastructure bonds nabad bonds and tuition fees is it very very clear yes so today we have completed section atc along with that we have also i have also summarized the section atc for you so section atc is over and one point is given to you as homework what is your homework difference between section atc point number 23 tuition fees and section at difference between section atc point number 23 tuition fees and section 80 e that you have to identify we'll discuss in the next lecture is that very very clear yes so we'll wind up here thank you everyone bye bye